Hello everyone and welcome to One Class. Uh, my name is Jeff Kraus. I have a PhD in physical chemistry and today I'm going to run through a few uh, undergraduate level uh, physics questions. So here's our first one, um, which might be a bit tricky to read. Um, um, okay, so we have a thermos of uh, 142 centimeters cubed of coffee. So that's our, our uh, volume. Um, at 86.3 degrees Celsius. And now to cool the coffee, we're gonna drop um, <clears throat> two 10.1 gram ice cubes into the thermos, which are initially at a temperature um, I don't know what I was trying to write there. Ice cubes. And so the initial temperature is uh, zero degrees Celsius. And now we're going to let them melt completely at that temperature. And we want to know the final temperature of the coffee and treat the coffee as water. So what that means is um, for a coffee, we're going to use a heat capacity of uh, 4.184 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. And I'm going to assume a density of uh, 1.0 gram per mil. Um, and a liter is a decimeter cubed or a mil is a centimeter cubed. Um, so that's going to lead to a pretty nice conversion here because our coffee is then 142 centimeters cubed. I uh, might as well preface this with some kind of indicator. So our mass of our coffee is 142 centimeters cubed times one um, gram per mil uh, times one mil per centimeter cubed. So then all these cancel. And so our mass of our coffee is just 142 grams, which makes that pretty nice. Um, okay. And so we're actually gonna have to do this in two steps. Uh, the first step is going to be the ice cube melting. And then the second step is going to be uh, the liquid equilibration. So in both steps, we're going to use that, um, so our thermos of coffee with a couple of ice cubes in it is our system. And it's completely isolated, so delta H for our system is zero. Now, delta H for our system is going to be composed of two pieces. Um, the ice, um, so delta H melt for ice is 333.55 uh, joules per gram. So then um, for all of our ice, our delta H for our ice is going to be 333.55 joules per gram multiplied by um, two times 10.1 grams. So that's our, our total mass of ice that we have. And so to completely melt all of the ice, 
we're going to need a uh, six seven three seven point seven one joules so that's how much energy it's going to take to melt the ice and then for a coffee we're going to use um, MC delta T where delta T in this case is, well, and it always is, is TF minus TI, um, where we have each of these quantities. And so that's our, that's all of our system, right? So that's our ice and that's our coffee. And so now uh, delta H system is equal to 67.37.71 joules plus mc. Uh, I guess I can put in values there in retrospect, so let's do that. So the mass of the coffee is uh, 142 grams. Our heat capacity for the coffee, which we're treating as water, is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And then I'm just gonna add in the TF minus TI over here. So the final temperature I'm looking for and my initial temperature is 86.3 degrees Celsius. And so this all equals zero. And now I can rearrange this for uh, TF. Um, actually, I'm just gonna rearrange it for uh, TF minus TI, just for simplicity. So TF minus 86.3 degrees Celsius is equal to minus 67.37.71 joules over 142 grams. And so we can see here, these units are gonna cancel. And we're gonna end up with degrees Celsius up top. And so then that equals uh, minus 11.34. And so then um, rearranging, our final temperature is 74.96 degrees Celsius. Um, so we're not done yet, but uh, this is a good point to do just a quick check to make sure we didn't make any mistakes. We expect the coffee to be colder, not warmer. If, it, if we had gotten an answer higher than our initial temperature, then we likely messed up the sign on our delta H melt. Remember that delta H melt should be positive as it's an energy in input to the ice to melt it. Um, whereas if we were freezing it, it would be a negative. So we would have to release energy to the surrounding to freeze the ice. Um, but again, this is just, uh, usually your answers are a good place to check. Okay, so that looks good. Um, but we're not done yet because now we have 142 grams of coffee at a temperature of 74.96 degrees Celsius. And we have uh, 20.2 grams of water at zero degrees Celsius. So we melted the ice, but we didn't raise the temperature. Now we just have liquid water. Uh, both have a heat capacity of 4.184 uh, joules per gram degrees Celsius. So now we basically just have a thermos um, with some liquids and pockets of, <laughs> of water and, and coffee. So now the, we need to handle all the temperature equilibration. So delta H, um, delta H system is equal to zero. Um, and our delta H system is going to be MC 
delta T for the water plus MC delta T for the coffee. Okay. Um, so now we can write this as filling in some values. So that's going to be for the water. Uh, TF minus uh, zero. And nope, for the coffee, that's 142. Temperature of the coffee was 74.96. All right, uh, so we can make some simplifications here because um, the C actually is the same for both, so we can divide that out. And because it's zero on the other side, that is still going to be zero because zero divided by anything is still zero. Um, and that's really all the simplification we're going to be able to do. So if through some rearrangement here, we're going to get zero is equal to uh, 162.2 grams times TF minus 106.42 grams degrees Celsius. So that's just collecting like terms in the final temperature. And then uh, rearranging again, we get that our TF is 65.62 degrees Celsius. And so that's the temperature, the final temperature that our system reaches. Okay. So now uh, checking the solution here. Um, so here's the mass of our coffee, specific heat. Um, so the, yeah, so the solution here only has the first half. Um, so it's incomplete. say it's incorrect. Okay. Um, all right, so here's our second one. We have um, <clears throat> a wire loop, um, which is square, in between um, a north and a south pole. And I'm just gonna redraw it because I just feel more comfortable with that, I guess. <laughs> so that means we have a, a constant B field through the through the loop. And our um, and we rotate with a constant uh, torque. Or a, sorry, an external torque with a constant angular velocity, so that makes sense. So our omega is constant. Um, and our B is uh, 0 0.17 Tesla. And it wants to know what the maximum of the induced EMF, so it wants um, our maximum and okay no okay so um our phi oh yeah it also says that uh, it's a square with 17 centimeters on each side okay so our flux 
is B dot A. Now our area, um, we can, I think this will help us for the future. So our area is either going to be, um, we're gonna treat this like a square. It's either gonna be pointing out of the page. Well, as it rotates, it's gonna be moving, but the area could be pointing out of the page or it could be pointing to the right or as it flips around, um, let's see if I can <laughs> draw this, um, any angle in between. Um, so the way I'm gonna represent this is that the area is just the, um, the area you would compute. So A being 17 centimeters squared. And I'm going to use just cos omega t i hat plus sine omega t. Uh, I'm going to use uh, j hat. Okay, so um, putting a, just a bit of an axis in there, right? So i and uh, it would be, I guess, coming out of the page would be there, or J. Um, but that's okay. Okay, so then if our B field is then um, like this, then our B is actually B I hat. And so then B dot A is equal to B A cosine omega T. Okay. So that gives us um, our time dependent term. And I believe that that actually works pretty well. Um, Yep. Okay, so then if we want to know our maximum flux, well, our flux is minus d phi. Or, sorry, if we want to know our maximum EMF, our EMF is minus d phi by dt, which is um, minus b a. And then the derivative of cos omega t by dt is omega sine omega t um, with a positive now. And so then um, our maximum is going to occur where sine omega t is one. And so our EMF max is just B A omega, which is 0 0.17 Tesla times uh, 17 times 10 to the minus two meters squared. So just converting the centimeters to meters. And then our omega is given in the question as um, the loop makes a full turn every 0.24 seconds. So our period is given as 0 0.24 seconds. And so our omega is uh, two pi over our period. So just like that, running these values through on our calculator, we get, um, 0 0.1286 um, and a Tesla is a kilogram uh, per second squared amp times a meter squared times one over seconds. And so we get a kilogram meter squared per second cubed amp, which is actually a volt. 
So that's good. So that's our, um, our maximum EMF. And so then um, for the next part, which I'm calling B, and the question seems to call six. Um, so if E is zero at T equals zero, so I didn't allow for, um, I didn't allow for any uh, phase in my, in my expression. So if my E is B A omega, sine omega t, or yeah, so my, uh, yeah, sine omega t, uh, I probably should have allowed a phase in there, but it, as you can see, e at t equals zero, sine omega t is b a omega sine of zero, which is zero. So I've actually set it up appropriately without really realizing it. Um, so that's good. Um, and so it asks, what is the minimal time after um, solve for t over the period after which it has reached 15% of its maximum? Okay, so I've already said that E max is B A omega. So then E for um, 0 0.15 is just 0 0.15 times B A omega. So now it wants me to solve for time. So then uh, 0 0.15 B A omega is equal to my expression. So B A omega sine omega t. So I can obviously cancel out these terms. And so 0 0.15 is equal to sine omega t. And so my time is going to be, um, and then my omega is 2 pi over t, so sine 2 pi t over the period and or solving for the time then I would get 2 pi t over t is equal to the arc sine of 0 0.15 <clears throat> plus uh, 2 pi n it wants to know the minimum time so we don't have to worry about that but it is uh, periodic and so um, I didn't uh, finish this up, but anyway. Uh, so our t over our period is then the, just the arc sine of 0 0.15 over 2 pi um, plus n. Now our minimum time is going to be where n equals zero. And so uh, that would be our our minimum t over the period where our, our EMF goes to 0.15 of the maximum. Uh, oh, it says to use two significant figures. Um, okay. Um, well, we can simplify this a little bit by using Um, I didn't fill out the answer, but I'll just do it then. So if we use 0 0.15, um, and we'll want it to be in radians, um, and just inverse sine, and divide by 2. Go, and divide by pi. Sort. Our minimum t over our period is then uh, 0.024. So let's 
easily rectified. Um, okay, and then the final uh, question in here, which is label two, is, um, I guess I'm gonna call it C, is we have a coil of NA turns enclosing an area of A. So um, we have an area A. And we have NA turns of coil. Okay. In a physics laboratory, the coil's rotated uh, during the time interval uh, delta T. Um, from a position in which the plane of each turn is perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field. So our coils are like this. Oh, the plane of the coils. So it should actually be this. So the B and the A vector are lined up um, to one in which the plane is parallel to the field. So we're going like this. So there's our coils. There's our B field, and there's our A vector. Might as well put vectors. And that's over the period of delta T. What is the magnitude of the average EMF induced in the coil? So our EMF is, in this case, all we can say is that it's delta phi over delta T. So that would be our average EMF. Now our delta phi, our phi, I should say, uh, particularly in this case, was always b dot a. So in this case, our phi is uh, b a. And in this case, our phi is zero. So then delta phi is just phi final minus phi initial, or our flux final minus our flux initial over our delta T, which is minus BA over delta T. Or um, now, of course, there are NA coils. So this would only count for one coil. So these all need to be multiplied by NA. So um, it would actually be minus BA and A. And so it only asks for magnitude anyway. So our average EMF would be uh, B, A, and A over delta T. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that would be, that would be it. Okay. Um, so if we check through each of our solutions there, um, there's actually no solution for this question. Um, so it's obviously incomplete, um, but that is, that all looks pretty good to me. Um, so I'm just gonna put uh, incomplete. And there. Um, Okay, so now for our next one, um, we have uh, two blocks on an incline. Um, if I draw this in a terrible way. Uh, so I've got 40 degrees here, 55 degrees here. I've got a pulley, which uh, there's not really anything given in this question other than what's shown, but um, I'm gonna assume it's, it's frictionless and all that. And these two are connected by a string. Um, and it wants to know the magnitude of the force parallel to the surface one and the surface two. 
Um, so that's pretty easy to do because we're actually going to want to uh, represent things in each of those systems and kind of move back and forth. So what I mean by that is I'm just going to take surface one here and I've got my 0.8 kilogram block and I've got my tension, my mass and I'm actually going to want to represent this as uh, x, y so rather than um, a regular x, y but an inclined x, y and it makes things a bit easier for me um, because I can break down, although my, my mass, uh, my mg force is now a little bit weird. <clears throat> so my 40 degrees is there. So the similar triangle is this one. Um, I believe that's right. that up. No, it's this one. I did mess it up. Okay. Um, so then that means uh, that 40 degrees is there. And so <clears throat> if 40 degrees is there and my mg is there, then this is mg sine theta or sine 40 and um, this is mg cos 40 so then um, our x force is now uh, t in the positive direction and our mg lies in the negative direction so minus mg sine of 40 and um, it turns out that this is sliding um, or it, it will have to so you've got an max term so some kind of acceleration in the x direction and then we're going to do our y just for completion because in the y direction we have um, our, our surface normal minus our mg co cos 40 is equal to zero. Okay, and so from our x force, we can say that, um, and I should have put some indicators here for the mass. So our tension over our m1 minus g sine of 40 is equal to our acceleration. Okay. And now for the second side, so the 55 degree side, um, and this should actually be a bigger angle, not a smaller one. So the 55 degree side, we've got a mass and just to keep roughly in the same uh, direction, we're going to use x down the slope and y up the slope. Um, and so our tension is now back this way and our mg is downward. So again, um, so there's our mg, we're going to make a similar triangle. And so this will be the 55. And so then we've got an mg sine 55 um, going this way and an mg cos 55 going this way. And so our x force, 
is uh, minus t uh, plus m2g uh, sine 55 equals m2ax. And so our, the acceleration in the x is actually going to be the same between the two blocks because they are connected. And our Fy, again, just for completeness, is going to be a nor the normal minus mg cos 55 equals 0, as it isn't moving in the y direction. But um, that's not really going to do anything for us. So in this case, minus t over m2 um, plus g cosine of 55 is equal to our acceleration. And so now we have two equations in terms, uh, oops, not cos, sorry. Should be sine. Now we have two equations in terms of uh, the acceleration, so we can solve for our tension. Um, so in this case, we have t over m1. Um, minus g sine of 40 <clears throat> um, is equal to uh, minus t over m2 plus g sine of 55. So just by setting our accelerations equal to each other, and so then we have um, t over m1 plus t over m2 is equal to g sine 55 plus uh, sine of 40. Um, so putting in some values here, 9.8 times um, sine of 55 plus sine of 40. And I actually um, didn't do the value there, so I'm just going to do it right now. So 55 sine plus 40 uh, sine. So that's 1.46, so times 9.8 is 14.323 or 327 sorry and so that's all going to be divided by so pulling the temperature out on the left side so our temperature is then 14 or not temperature sorry our tension is then 14.327 over 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2, um, which is given in the question. Um, and this should be in uh, meters per second squared. My apologies. Shouldn't drop units. Um, so this should be uh, 1 over 0 0.8 kilograms plus one over 0 0.5 kilograms, which comes out to be um, 14.327 meters per second squared, all over uh, 3.25 one over kilograms. And uh, so this is then uh, 4.408 newtons. Okay, so that looks good. Um, and so the force uh, parallel to surface one is then just our x force that we did up above. So our x force is uh, minus t plus um, mg sine 40 for surface one 
and minus t plus or t minus mg sine 40 for surface one and minus t plus mg sine 55 for surface two. So these are our, our forces uh, parallel to, to their individual surfaces. But I'm just gonna recopy them down here. So uh, for surface one, our fx is um, t minus m1g sine of 40. And for surface two, so 4.408 newtons minus uh, 0 0.8 kilograms. 9.8 meters per second squared times the sine of 40. And again, I just have to recalculate that a bit. So 40 sine uh, times 9.8 times 0 0.8. Um, and um, So it's minus uh, 0 0.631 Newtons. Um, so it's going down the slope. And then for surface two, Fx is uh, T minus T plus M2G sine 55, which putting in our values is uh, minus 4.408 Newtons plus um, our mass for two is 0.5 kilograms, 0 0.5, 9.8 meters per second squared times the sine of 55, which is equal to um, 4.408, so is minus um, 0 0.394 newtons. Okay, so there's our forces, our total forces parallel to the surfaces. So that's um, that's A here, and that's B. And they're both in the negative direction, so they're both going to the left of the figure that's shown. Okay, so now let's check the solution. Um, so the magnitude of the force parallel to surface one. Uh, so these are just computing the tensions, which came out to be 4.408, but isn't including the uh, contribution from the mass. Um, so, uh, I would say this is incomplete. Um, so tension is correct. Uh, hasn't included other components. Answer. So again, I'm just gonna say it's incorrect. Okay, so here we have um, a grid-based uh, force time plot. And I'm just gonna um, redraw it partially to balloon it up a little bit, but also to put in some values here. So I'm gonna try to draw it as best I can. So that's two, that's four, that's six. That's seven, eight, and nine. So that's
that's T. And then our force is over here, that's 20. And that's 10. Okay. So it wants to know um, if we have a mass of 5.8 kilograms. And this is our force over time plot. What is, um, and we begin at rest, so our VI is zero. What is VF given this force time plot? Um, <clears throat> so our F is equal to MA, which is M dV by dt. And so we can see um, that <clears throat> our dV is, by just uh, moving the delta time over, uh, F over M dt. So we can get our uh, Vf minus Vi by integrating, I'm going to bring the mass out, our force time plot, or force with time. So basically we can use the areas in this plot to readily calculate our final minus initial. And in fact we can do um, each segment individually and calculate a VF at each point. Um, or we can just do the whole thing, which is going to be a bit, quite a bit easier. So, and I'm going to use just areas in here. So our first area here is uh, from zero to two seconds. And maybe actually I'll just work around this and you can follow along. So, um, so that means our first area in here is this one. And so our integral of f dt is just equal to um, the area of a triangle with height 20 and width 2 seconds, right? So 2 seconds times 20 newtons times a half, so the half just comes from it being the area of a triangle, and so then that's equal to 20 newton seconds. So this area in here is just a rectangle, so the integral of f dt is just the width is 2 seconds, the height is 20 newtons, so 20 newtons times 2 seconds, which is 40 newton seconds. The area in here is again just the area of a triangle. So 20 newtons times the, the base is two seconds times a half, which is 20 newton seconds. The area in here is the area of a triangle, but our force is now negative, so negative 10 newtons times one second times a half, which is minus five newton seconds. And now I'm, uh, <laughs> now I'm running out of a, a space, so I guess this wasn't so perfect, but I'm gonna copy those values down and then do the latter, the latter one. So our, our region, one was uh, 20 newton seconds, a region two came out to be um, 40 newton seconds, a region three came out to be 20, a region four came out to be negative five. Okay, so now our fifth region is um, this triangle, this rectangle in here which is um, integral f dt is minus 10 newtons times one second. So minus 10 newton seconds. So that would be five. And then our final region 
is this triangle over here which is again a base of one second and a height of 10 newtons. So it's also gonna be uh, that value for there. So then our sixth region is just minus five newton seconds. So then our, in, our total FDT is just the sum of all these. So 20, so if we just sum them all up, I'm not gonna bother writing it all out. So 20 plus 40 is 60, plus 20 is 80, and then minus another 20 is 60 newton seconds. So our total area is a positive 60 newton seconds. And now um, that means that our VF minus our VI is one over the mass times 20, 60 newton seconds. Uh, VI is zero, so our VF is um, 60 newton seconds over 5.8 kilograms. Now a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So that's gonna cancel the kilogram and leave us, and there's a second here, so that'll also cancel and leave us with meters per second. And so then there's our uh, final velocity. Okay. Um, all right, so there's um, no solution here. So obviously it's incorrect. All right, so um, you're with 19 other people on a boat at rest in frictionless water. So, we're on a boat and there's a bunch of people. Um, and the um, initial position doesn't really matter so the mass of our people is 1300 kilograms and I'm gonna put the center of mass of the boat there and so our X for our people is given by that um, and so, and I'm going to put the X for the boat at its center of mass, but I'm gonna say that the X for the boat is zero, so I'm setting that as our zero. Um, and the boat's mass is 10,000 kilograms. So then our, um, our initial X center of mass is then um, is then X uh, B times MB plus uh, XP times MP. So that's the position of the people times the mass of the people over the mass of the boat plus the mass of the people. Now, if that is my zero, then that goes to zero. And so then our initial X center of mass is just X people, M people, over the mass of the boat plus the mass of the people. Now, when the people, now everyone moves, and they move from one side of the boat to the other one. And <clears throat> so, we, uh, so now everyone moves a full uh, five meters. 
And so now we've got an XP um, prime. So our XP prime is our original position minus five meters. And it wants to know now what XB prime is equal to. And so um, the idea here is um, that the center of mass won't want to move or the whole object will want to stay at rest. And so the boat is going to displace to effectively stay at rest, meaning our new center of mass should equal our old center of mass. Our new center of mass being um, the new position of the boat times the mass of the boat plus the new position of the people times the mass of the people. Um, right, I, that's what I left out in my solution. Um, so, yeah, okay, now I realize what I did wrong. Um, okay, so we're going to need a, a fixed axis system that doesn't move. And in that we have our XB equals zero. And so now in our fixed axis system that doesn't move, um, our zero is here. And so now that's XB prime. And so, um, and so our people have moved not just to XP minus five meters, but the boat has also moved so we need to add on XB prime as the boat has also translated. Okay, so then, uh, but that's fine because we can still define our center of mass as this. And so now um, this comes out to be XB prime times the mass of the boat. Our XP prime is XP minus five meters plus XB prime all over the mass of the boat plus the mass of the people. Um, okay, and now we can solve this, or at least we can rearrange this a little bit. So we've got XP prime MB plus MP all over MB plus MP plus, so I've just brought the XB prime over, um, XP minus five meters times MP over MB plus MP. Okay, now, um, as I said, we're going to set the, uh, the center of mass initially to the center of mass after. And so the initial center of mass was MP or XP MP over MB plus MP. And so then that's going to equal, uh, these can cancel, XB prime plus XP. And I'm just going to expand this out just for um, what will become obvious in a second here. So now these two terms will cancel. And then our XB prime, so our new position of our boat, is just five meters times uh, MP over MB plus MP. Okay. Um, so then our 
xb prime is just five meters times our mass of our people is 1300 kilograms and the mass of the boat plus the mass of the people is uh, 10,000 kilograms plus 1300 kilograms and so then xb prime comes out to be I'm just going to need to grab my calculator again as I um, so 10,000 plus 1,300, uh, 1 over times 1,300 times 5, um, comes out to be uh, 0 0.575 meters. So then the boat shifts by 0 0.75 meters, um, or 57.5 centimeters, depending on which one you like. Um, and uh, so I included some sign in this, but if we check the solution, um, <clears throat> so indeed we just set our center of mass before to after, um, this person computed um, just like this, and you just used pluses for the motion of everything, um, which is fine. So that's the reason why theirs came out negative, but they noticed them. And so we get 57.5 uh, centimeters or 0.575 meters. So that is correct. All right. Um, so now for this one, We've got a uh, thin rod of length L um, hanging from um, a pivot. And it's um, There's a string. Um, <laughs> the um, the total length is L. The mass is M. Um, and the mode of inertia is given as um, two M L over three. Uh, what force is the pivot point exerting on the rod? So at present, um, the mode of inertia doesn't really matter. And all that matters right now is we've got a tension, a gravitational force, which would be acting at L over two. And then the, um, the pivot point, some normal force. Um, so we can use our torques or the sum of our torques to figure out um, uh, what our tension is in our string. So um, the sum of our torques must be zero as it's not moving. So for our tension, for our tension, uh, or our string, our torque is F cross R, or this is actually true for anything. Um, the string is located at three quarters the length, so that's three over four L. Um, and it is a cross product, so we point in the direction of the force and we represent them uh, tail to tail, so our tension is up, our R is out here. So if we use the right hand rule, we point our fingers in the, in the direction of the torque, our palm towards the R, or towards the tension, sorry, and then the thumb will point in the direction of the force. So in this case, um, the force is into the page, which I'm going to call a negative force, or a negative torque, sorry. 
and so this but they are 90 degrees so um, it'll just come out to be minus T times 3 quarters L um, I guess I'll throw in the sine of the angle but the sine in this case phi is 90 degrees so the sine of phi is 1 so then this is just minus t times 3 quarters L um, and then for our mg force our torque is again F cross R in this case our mg acts down our radius or our R goes in this direction our um, mg is down and again using right hand rule uh, we'll find that that's a positive torque so we get mg times L over 2 and again they're 90 degrees so phi is 90 and sine of phi is 1 um, okay so now uh, the sum of our torques is zero, meaning, um, and the normal, of course, will have an R of zero, so it won't contribute. So these are the only torques that will contribute. So minus T times 3 quarters L plus mg L over 2 is equal to zero. We can cancel our L's and rearrange for our tension to say that T is 2 mg over 3. And now to solve for the force from the pivot point, we can use that our, not only our sum of torques is zero, but our sum of our forces is zero. Our sum of our forces is equal to um, N plus T minus mg, which equals zero. We just solved for our tension as two mg over three. And so we get that our normal force is one third mg. The positive sign meaning that it is indeed acting upward as we assumed initially. Okay, so now um, <clears throat> for B, or for the next part of this, if we cut the rope at t equals zero, then immediately what is the angular acceleration? So uh, that's pretty simple. So our, our torque, our sum of our torques is I alpha. So that will give it to us right away. Now though with the rope cut, we really just have a pivot point and a rod with mg acting at L over two. So that our torque is just um, F cross R as it was before, which comes, which came out to be mg L over two. Our moment of inertia is given in the question as um, somewhere here, um, ML two, two thirds ML. So then our torque is equal to I alpha or mg L over two is equal to two thirds ML alpha. The L's will cancel, the M will cancel, and uh, we can bring all this stuff over. So alpha is then um, three G over four. So there's our angular acceleration. 
Um, <clears throat> it wants the transverse acceleration of the rod center of mass. So um, remember that um, alpha is uh, v squared over r. Sorry, it's not that. That was a mistake. A is V squared over R. Um, <clears throat> so V is omega R. Oh, it's transverse acceleration. So A is alpha R. My apologies. So the transverse acceleration, A is just alpha times the radius. So for C, um, for the center of mass, um, R is just L over 2. So our A is just our alpha, 3G over 4, times L over 2. So just 3G L over 8. And then for D, the far end of the rod, R is L. So A is 3G over 4, times L which is uh, 3GL over 4. Um, <clears throat> and so then the, and then finally the force exerted by the pivot point um, at this point, um, <clears throat> right away when the, when the string is cut, um, there is no, there is no need to hold it in, so I would say that it's zero. Um, although, having said that, I think it must be, yeah, I think it's zero. But I'm not sure on that one. So that's what it's got. And because there is again uh, no solution, um, I'm just going to say it's incomplete. And say so this is incorrect. All right. Um, so this one's a quick one. Um, in each of the parts A, B, and C, find the direction of current flow. So um, for the first one, so for in this case we're using uh, the right hand the right hand rule for current flow. So you run your uh, thumb in the direction of current flow, and then your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So if, if your current is going this way, then your fingers will wrap around in the direction of the B field. So that's the B field. So then um, if we look at the first one here, where these are going into the page, this then our um, so this is out of the page this is into the page so if we use our right hand rule and follow it the only way to get a B field that's in on this side and out on this side by wrapping our fingers is to say that the current is running this way um, so for B we have um, a point in the middle and the B field is going around uh, counterclockwise. And so if you again have your, um, have your thumb pointed out towards you or out of the page, you'll notice your fingers will curl around counterclockwise, which means that the current here is out of the page. 
Okay, so then the current is flowing like that. And then if we look at C, where we have um, a wire running, and these are all into the page, these are out of the page, and if we run our thumb along a uh, direction, we'll notice if we run our thumb along this direction, that the B field will be in on the right side and coming out on the left side. So the current must be going that way. Okay, um, so check our solution here. So current flowing through the wire, we use the right hand rule. Um, so the current is flowing from right to left, so it looks good. For B, it's out of the page, good. And from lower left to upper right, so that looks good. So this is correct. All right. Um, so here we have uh, some guy wires on a telephone pole. Um, and it wants us to represent the force in the wires in Cartesian form. So just those two tensions. Um, so we can see that our A force, um, so what this means, just to start off here, is that it wants us to represent our FA as the force value times the unit vector in the direction. And now the unit vector is just um, the full vector over the uh, full vector over the magnitude. So um, <clears throat> so let's look at this. So we've got for A, and I'm just going to sketch it here. So Y is this way, X is this way. So it's um, and Z is this way. And so A is four meters up to that point. And then we're going to, um, I believe it's one meter over and four meters back. So that is our A. Um, and so we've got two vectors here. I'm going to call this R1 and R2, just to differentiate them. And so we can see that R1 plus RA equals R2, just by following the arrows. So our, if you follow along the arrow of R1 at RA, then you get to the end of R2 or our A here is R2 minus R1. R2 is um, the position that's out, so where the, uh, where the final part of the guy wire is. So if we look at this, we've got uh, minus one in the X hat direction, and uh, it's in the positive y, so plus 4 in the y hat direction. R1 is the, um, is the vector to the point on the pole where it starts, and it's given as just 4 uh, z hat. I'm kind of dropping the units here. Um, I guess I can keep them around, but I'll show you why I dropped them in a second. So then RA is just R2 minus R1, which is minus one meter X hat plus four meters Y hat um, minus four meters Z hat. And at this point, this should make sense as well. So we're looking at the vector that's shown for FA there 
and we can see that it's going downward, so the minus on the z makes sense, and it must be going in the negative x and the positive y. Now the magnitude of our a is just the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. And I've dropped the negatives because a negative squared is a positive, so I don't need it. And so this comes out to be the square root of 33 meters. And so then our unit vector, our a hat, is our a over our a magnitude, which comes out to be negative one meter over root 33 meters x hat plus four meters over root 33 meters. And I pulled the meters out. It would be meters squared, but the square root of meters squared is meters minus four meters z hat over root 33 meters. So we see here that the meters cancel which is why I, I initially dropped them. And so then our a, our a hat is completely unitless as it should be. And, um, and the magnitude is one. So I'm just really writing it now in a bit more of a closed form. Okay, so then our, our force, Fa, is just our value times our unit vector, which is 250 newtons times uh, these. And then just for completion, I'm just going to multiply it all out. It really doesn't need to be, I don't think. But I'm going to do it anyway. And so this comes out to be minus 43.52 newtons x hat plus 178.04 newtons y hat minus 174.08 newtons z hat. Okay, and then for, um, for FB, uh, we're going to play the same game. So FB is the vector is the magnitude times a unit vector. Our unit vector is our B minus over our B magnitude. Our B in this case, um, again, just making a sketch. So I'm actually going to get rid of this just to sketch out what I'm going to use. So I've got um, x, y, z, x, y, z, and then b is going to go out to here. So I've got our b, and I'll call this our 3, our 4. And so then <clears throat> from this figure, you can see that our B is um, our four minus our three. So our four would be the vector that goes um, to the point on the ground and our three would be the one that goes to the starting point of B. So our four um, is the point on the ground which is given as um, two meters x hat minus three meters y hat. And then our three is just the vector that points to the starting of B, uh, which is given as 5.5 uh, .5 meters uh, z hat. So then our B is two meters x hat, minus three meters y hat, minus 5.5 .5 meters z hat. Um, so then 
Uh, so that's our vector. Our unit, our magnitude is the square root of two meters squared plus three meters squared plus 5.5 meters squared, all square rooted, which comes out to be um, the square root of 43.25 meters. So our unit vector is uh, our B over the magnitude, which comes out to be um, 2 over root 43.25 x hat minus 3 over root 43.25 y hat minus 5.5 over root 43.25 z hat. And so then our, our force is our magnitude times our unit vector, which in this case is 175 newtons times 2 over root 43.25 x hat minus 3 over root 43.25 y hat minus 5.5 over root 43.25 z hat. And then just for completion, doing out all the values, we get um, 53.22 x hat minus 79.83 newtons, don't forget my units, y hat minus 146.36 newtons uh, z hat. Okay, so there's my two vectors, <clears throat> and you can use i, j, and k if you like that better. Um, and so the first one is uh, this one here, so 43.5178, oh, maybe I messed up. That one. Oh, yeah, I must have messed up that one because they're the same number. So that's, must have messed up that one writing it out. Although I don't know why it's off by a little bit, but may, it's probably just rounding. So that would have to be 0 0.08. <laughs> so both of those would have to be the same. Must be just a rounding differences there. And oh, they're all down here. Okay, that makes it easier. 53.2, 79.8, 3 Okay, so there's the two written in a vector form. So that looks good. And um, I'm actually just going to say that that's enough for today, I think. So um, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe to one class. Uh, if you want to leave questions, please follow the links below the video. Uh, this has been Jeff Krause for one class, and I hope to see you again.